Good morning friends what a privilege it is for each one of us to come into the house of god virtually if not physically before we start the service let me encourage you from the word of god i am going to read psalm 92 the first two verses it says it is good to praise the lord and make music to your name o most high proclaiming your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night so before pramila comes in with the time of worship why don't you join me in prayer as we look to god today lord we want to thank you father that you help us to worship you in spirit and in truth a worship which is acceptable before you and a worship which glorifies your name and gladdens your heart help us lord to worship just like that in jesus name amen good morning friends It's a joy to come and worship the living God. I'm sure many of you would agree that troubles do not come at a convenient time. And the last few weeks with so many things happening popping here and there, I felt my happiness pop like this air balloon. But I was encouraged to be reminded that the joy on the other hand does not depend on the happenings around. I love Anushka to do a small experiment to show you that. Trouble. Happiness. Joy. Happiness. Joy. Joy, 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 joy. Joy. Indeed, I'm encouraged to know that as this water is in the balloon god's living waters lives in us amen and the fruit of his spirit is joy so even as we get into a time of worship may his joy be our strength and i would like to read from romans 15 may the god of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the holy spirit you may abound in hope amen i'm in a fight not physical i'm in a war but not with this war you are the light that's beautiful today cuz i never want to worry what tomorrow would bring my faith is on solid ground i'm counting on god i'm counting on 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 i'm counting on god In the miracle of Christ in me 
is the mystery that sets me free I'm nothing like I used to be Just open up your eyes, you'll see The miracle of Christ in me Is the mystery that sets me free I'm nothing like I used to be Just open up your eyes, you'll see Let's join our hearts because He deserves all the glory. Amen. Let's join our hearts, our voices, even as we worship Him from our homes. Yeshu Shoot. 
No. Yeah. 
perseverance and let perseverance have its fullest so that we would be mature and complete in everything Lord. Father I surrender each one of us here Lord wherever we are into your hands Lord that you're the God of miracles and whatever we are going through each one who is hearing this Lord I pray Lord that whatever the concern is Lord even as we bring it to your throne room Lord I pray for your divine intervention, Lord, that you're a God of miracles. And even as we lift our voices from our homes to give you honor and glory, Lord, because you are the name above all names, I pray and I believe, Lord, that you're the God of miracles would come into each and every home, Lord God, who's worshiping you right now, Lord. Thank you, Father, for you are a true God. Thank you, Jesus, that you died for me and each one of us here, Lord, that none should perish but have eternal life and have life abundant. And I speak, Lord, abundant life into our situation, into our homes this time, Lord. Let's just sing this song again, saying that you deserve the glory. Lord, we don't want to lift our concerns, but we want to lift your name on high, Lord. Whatever situation we are going through, Lord, we just lift your name that you deserve all glory, honor, and we want to raise our voice. I just encourage us from our homes to just lift our hands and say that you deserve all glory and honor in spite of our situation. You deserve the glory and the honor. our hands in worship as we lift your holy name you deserve the glory not our situation Lord 
surrender our lives, our families, each one of us, Lord, into your hands, Lord. You know exactly what we are going through, Lord. Father, in this time, Lord, we thank you, Father. Spirit of the living God, come fill each one of us, Lord, over here. But even as we sing our song to our daddy, God, the creator of heaven and earth, may it be a sweet offering to you, pleasing to you. Thank you, Lord, that in your presence there's fullness of joy. And we just surrender our voices, our thoughts, our hearts, our song to you and you alone.
to you, Lord. And your word says, Lord, that in your presence there's fullness of joy, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for your joy that is filling us, Lord Jesus, because of your sweet presence, Lord. I pray for your presence, sweet spirit, to be with us through this time. Thank you, Lord, for your sweet presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning friends, 
almost 3 months back holy spirit of god led me to draw the picture of a house with a pen bucket this house looked like this and after drawing this picture i was waiting on god to reveal to me what this means but i could not hear anything from god and 3 months passed by and as i was waiting on god for the prophetic word god reminded me about this picture of a house and you know he started telling me that he has created family he has ordained families and he loves that he has placed us in the family so that we could love each other to the fullest and enjoy his goodness and mercy in abundance and so that we could glorify his name and witness Christ wherever he has placed them and as i was waiting he started asking me is there anything that has taken the place between husband and wives children and the parent if so that friends he is asking to repair those scars to paint the walls of the house of our homes so that it will become once again new refreshing and full of life husband i believe that god is asking you all to encourage your wife to spend time with god and to spend quality time with you and with the children and wives encourage your husbands to walk in the confidence of god so that his name will be glorified and parents those who are having difficult children those who are disobedient and stubborn to uh, what you follow what you say i i sense that god is asking each one of us to be patient with them to persevere them to love them unconditionally because god has given them to us as a gift they were reward from the heaven and children those who are having difficult parent do not bother the, about that do not compare that they are not good enough uh, to become as your parent be sub- still be submissive to them no matter how they are and love them and pray for them one day you you will see breakthrough you will see victory in the name of the lord jesus christ our families are ordained to worship god to serve god as in joshua 24:15 says and if it seems evil to you to serve the lord choose for yourself this day whom you will serve whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of amorite in whose land you dwell but as for me and my house we will serve the lord thank you so much thank you pramila and anushka and neelu for the worship and the encouraging word so with our faith increased let us pray for our country do join me lord jesus father we want to thank you for the privilege of being born in such a great country as india lord we want to thank you that you have good plans for every individual in this country plans to prosper us plans to see to it lord that this country becomes a place of love and justice lord father we pray for those who are weak for those who are at the receiving end of disturbed housing and work because of these excessive rains father we pray that you would protect them lord we pray that every country that every citizen in our country will have enough to eat lord and they will have enough work to do and lord we pray that you will bless our country with every kind of good blessing from your hand in jesus name we pray amen
friends this is a special announcement for the foundation course which is starting on 25th july and it will run for six consecutive sundays from 3 pm to 4:30 pm over the zoom and uh, if you are interested in the foundation course to reach out to the us on the number which is displayed on the screen uh, this foundation course will talk about the basic facets of the bible it talk about who is god what is sin and how we have received salvation and liberation through jesus how can we develop godly habits for our spiritual maturity and all of these questions will be answered in this foundation course it will highly recommended for those of us who are exploring jesus or want to know about jesus and the bible do reach out to us on the number which is displayed on the screen and do register for the same it will be a good time of interaction to know more about god and the bible and do watch this video to know more about the course as well one way that we worship god is financially by giving our tithes and offerings so just like the services cell groups and interactions have moved online even tithes and offerings have moved online and you can see in the chat box the link which you can use to send across your tithes and offerings to bbc however if you would like to use a check you may have to visit the bbc office or courier it to the bbc office so let me pray for this very special way in which we worship god lord we want to thank you father that as we give away our tithes and offerings lord we realize that they belong to you in fact all that we have really belongs to you and lord jesus we pray that the tithe and offering will be blessed and will be multiplied like the two fish and the five loaves Lord that the tithes and offerings will accomplish much for your kingdom Lord and for our dear ones who are in full time and who are helping us run the affairs of BBC we thank you father in Jesus name amen so in this week going forward we are going to look at acts chapter 27 and our friend samuel thomas will read the chapter and then we will welcome our brother johnson as he comes in and takes the next installment in the book of acts scripture reading from acts chapter 27 verses 1 to 44 and when it was decided that we should sail for italy we delivered paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius and embarking on a ship of the Adramatium which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia we put to sea accompanied by Aristarchus a Macedonian from Thessalonica the next day we put in at Sidon and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for and putting out to sea from there we sailed another lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us 
and when we had sailed across the open sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra in Lysa. And then the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty at Nidus. And as the wind did not allow us to go farther, we sailed under the lee of Crete of Salmon. Coasting along it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lasia. Since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And because the harbour was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there, on the chance that they could somehow reach Phoenix, a harbour of Crete, facing both southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. Now when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete, close to the shore. But soon a tempestuous wind called the Northeaster struck down from the land, and when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Running under the lee of a small island called Cauda, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to ungird the ship. Then fearing they would run aground on Cyprus, they lowered the gear and thus were driven along. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo and on the third day they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up and said to them, Men, you should have listened to me and not set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of God to whom I belong and to whom I worship, and he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar, and behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God, that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on some island. When the fourteenth night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea, about midnight the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So they took a sounding and found twenty fathoms. A little farther, they took a sounding again and found fifteen fathoms, and fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for the day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under the pretense of laying out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and soldiers, Unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. As day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day you have continued in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength, for not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. And when he said these things, he took a bread. And giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. Then they were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. We were in all 276 persons in the ship. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. Now when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach, on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea, at the same time loosening the ropes that tied the rudders. Then hoisting the foresail to the wind they made for the beach, but striking a reef they ran the vessel aground. The bow struck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken 
by the serf. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners lest any of them should swim away and escape. But the centurion wishing to save Paul kept them from carrying their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest on planks and on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. Good morning, church. I take this opportunity to greet each one of you on this last Sunday of July 2020. I want to thank God for this rich opportunity to share from the word and I hope to integrate some personal learnings and experiences into what I count as an amazing opportunity of having heard from God. In fact, it has been such a great season and it was a little more than a year ago that we started the study from the book of Acts on 14th of June last year. But at this point of time, uh, allow me to show this visual where the words that we are frequently hearing are something altogether different. Uh, there are a lot of talk about getting jabs, we recently had a cloud burst. People still talk of COVID appropriate behavior, masks, social distancing, work from home, cyclone. In the midst of this cacophony of phrases that we have never used, we have never heard. I want to share a quote and this is a quote by Gregory Williams and very frequently uh, used by Dr. John Maxwell. Uh, in fact, last year after I spoke from Acts chapter 8, uh, in some of my readings I came across this quote and I read this for you. On the other side of the storm is the strength that comes from having navigated through it. Raise your sail and begin. So friends, allow me as a seafarer and as a navigator to share this message which I have titled Voyage Through the Storm, a journey of Acts 27 verses 1 to 44. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you speak to us and how alive and rich is your word that may have been written at the time that it was written, but it is an eternal living word through which the Holy Spirit speaks to us and into our circumstances. So, we are ready, our ears are tuned, speak to us Lord, we ask this in Jesus name, Amen. Do you know the NIV Bible and uh, most other versions uh, divide Acts chapter 27 into three parts, which is what I have retained uh, in this journey of Acts 27, but with a little tweak of the titles. So, we will start the first part and I have called it sailing vision, the first 12 verses. Next, we will examine the strategy used to face the storms. They may be expected, unexpected, but there are storms. And finally, in verses 27 to 44, we will hear of a shipwreck, but it is a good ending because all lives were saved. Now, I mentioned that I am a navigator and as a navigator, a plan on a chart is basic for the profession. And the study Bibles provide us this rich content and people have made the possible route that Paul would have taken and in many of the speakers who have gone before me have shared with you the three missionary journeys. And if you go into a reference Bible and if you look at Paul's last journey to Rome, so you will see this map. Now, even as I was looking at this map and maybe some of us will identify the Mediterranean Sea geography. On a personal note, I first encountered this in November 1983. One would expect that the Mediterranean being an enclosed should be a calm sea, 
but you know in my very first passage through the Mediterranean, it was very rough and it is frequently so. The physical storms in these early years of my life at sea gave me a number of life learnings that I have recently started putting together in a compilation that I call Seascape. Uh, I am set to retire from naval service uh, in about a month and a half and uh, rather just over two months and so the lessons called Seascape, I will share some of them. But let us go to the scripture and let us go to the first part. Acts 27 verse 1. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius who belonged to the imperial regiment. We boarded a ship from Adramitium about to sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia and we put out to sea. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica was with us. The next day we landed at Sidon and Julius in kindness to Paul allowed him to go to his friends and so that they might provide for his needs. From there we put out to sea again and passed to the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. When we had sailed across the open sea of the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra and Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us on board. We made slow headway for many days and I had difficulty arriving off Snidus. When the winds did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the lee of Crete opposite Samon. We moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fair Heavens near the town of Lassia. Much time had been lost and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the day of atonement. So, Paul warned them, men I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion instead of listening to what Paul said followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in the majority decided that we should sail on hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbor in Crete facing both southwest and northwest. The message from the scripture passage resonates with what the Holy Spirit has over many years to us as the BBC family and to me personally inscribed in different phases to many godly teachers and I want to say that the vital learning from this passage or learning begins with a vision. And so, the sailing vision, every voyage is birthed with a vision. A vision is authenticated by a mandate. Do you know how to recognize that vision is important. If I mention that we set sail with no vision or destination in mind, we are guaranteed success because we will reach nowhere. So, a vision is the first part and the first and most important part of the vision is a mandate and let us look at mandate in two different perspectives. If we look at verse 1, it says when it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius who belonged to the imperial regiment. So, the mandate for the sailing voyage that Paul embarked had a sovereign or a governance mandate duly authenticated by the presence of someone from the ruling authority. Many times we can talk in discussions about things that affect around us, but one of the questions we must always ask is what is the mandate? What does the law say? But we do not remain there. So, mandate is sovereign and then there is a second part which is divine mandate and to understand that we have to go four chapters prior to the current one. In Acts 23 11, it says the following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, take courage 
as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, you must also testify in Rome. So, the mandate to Paul was so clear because the Lord God had revealed to him, you will testify about me in Rome. The second part of the vision after mandate is what I call the means or the medium to fulfill it. And it is very interesting, uh, if you look at this uh, graphic of the voyage, I put to you this uh, quote that I have written, a voyage needs a vessel or a vehicle that fulfills the vision of those who embark on it. So, when Paul and the 276 passengers, we see that number in the later part of the chapter, had to go from Caesarea in Asia all the way to Rome, they needed a vessel. No vision can be fulfilled without a vehicle. What does that mean? Now, I wish I had a model, but uh, you can imagine how a ship looks like. And uh, I do not want to go very technical, because being a mariner, I can go in a lot of details. But let me say this, there are two words I want to talk about, when we talk about a vessel that sails. The first word is buoyancy. Now, to understand buoyancy, if you go to a swimming pool and people play water polo or you play with a plastic ball and you throw it in water, it does not sink, because it is buoyant. The density of the total ball or any such object or even if you take a piece of wood is lesser than the density of water, so it does not sink. So, vessel has to be buoyant, which means the passage medium or where we are traveling the vehicle has to remain upright and above it. In fact, vehicle has to be on it. The second word is stability. And this is a bit more tricky, but I will just leave it to you uh, in this manner. Let us take the same ball example and there is a ball on water. Will you sit on the ball if you have to take a passage? No. Uh, if you look at a ferry, you look at a ship, a ship is made with a lot of design and technique and uh, the stability is a factor by which even if the wind turns the ship to one side, the stability of the ship will make it upright again. Okay? I will not go into more details in that. Both these together indicate that you cannot just use any vessel. A vessel must fulfill the needs of buoyancy and stability. When we choose the medium or means to fulfill our vision, we must understand that it will fulfill the vision of the ones who are embarked on it. So, uh, there was in various places through this passage, we will talk about vessels. And in fact, I will come back to this when I talk about the storms. The third element of vision and its effectiveness is to know the season and adapt to it. You know, the whole passage from Asia, Caesarea till Crete and uh, passing through Cyprus and towards the Lee, it happened on multiple ships, it was in a smooth manner. The season and conditions were ripe for sailing. Now, the need of the right season is not just for any traditional sailing or activity. Time and timing are key to success. You know, Paul says this, uh, uh, he, he mentions it, because towards the end of the portion that we just read, when they are uh, at Crete and Paul says in verse 9 and 10, say, I, the passage says that much time had been lost, sailing had become dangerous, because it was after the day of atonement or what the Jews called the Yom Kippur. So, Paul warns them and day of atonement you falls around September, October and after that the Mediterranean gets rough. So, Paul says, men I can see that a voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives. So, he warned it, seasons are important. So, let us now go and see what the change of season brings. Verse 13, when a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw the opportunity. So, they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete before very long a wind of hurricane force called the northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So, we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed 
to the lee of a small island called Coda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. So, the men hoisted it aboard, then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together, because they were afraid they would run aground on the sandbars of Sirtius. They lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm, that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of God to whom I belong and to whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So, keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. Captioned as a storm, this part from verse 13 is a swing in the story. As I mentioned earlier, in the season after September, October, that is after Yom Kippur, storms were a very frequent occurrence in the Mediterranean Sea. And I mentioned my first passage was in November of 1983. And I must tell you this, we were on a ship, uh, it was a cargo liner. Uh, I was with the shipping corporation and our ship was rolling and pitching. But then we just looked across onto the other side and we saw there was another ship that was tossing and turning about three times worse than us. And then we realized this is, this is really rough. But we come to this part which I have called the storm tested strategy. You know storms test our strategy and not just as particularly in the context that the passage is written, it tests the strategy of seafarers and their seaworthiness. So, I have written this, storms need not surprise us, if they trigger a suitable strategy. So, is there a strategy being revealed in this passage? Is there something of a storm testing strategy for our lives? Please allow me to pull out three learnings from this portion, where the violence of the storm tests values. And I will come back to values, but let me begin with the seafaring bit. Now, if we look at a sail ship, and you must have seen square shape, shape sails, rectangular shape sails, you must have seen triangular shape sails. And, uh, the usual logic is, you will sail with the wind pushing you from behind. But in reality, if you look at some sailing races, the sail makes a very close tight angle and you know you can sail up to 30 degrees into the wind, not directly into the wind and that is called close haul. By the way, when you sail in that manner, it is the most efficient way of sailing. It is, it tests the seafarer, but it sails very well. And of course, I am talking of sailing ships. So, the first strategy is, when the winds are fine, sail to the wind, which means find the right wind, where you have to go, come and get the wind in a manner that you have the maximum speed. It will test you, because a lot of adjustment will have to be done. When the wind gets high and the seas get rough, then another factor comes important. We may have to take the lee side or shelter side. Uh, if you have the option to go on the windward side or the leeward side, you will go where there is shelter, which is called the leeward side. And you will batten up the ship. Whatever is open, there is a wooden uh, cover, you will put a little 
peg over it so it doesn't move around. You will take ropes in the passage you heard, the lifeboat was there and the lifeboat kind of dangles. So, you tie it up with extra ropes because you do not want to leave anything. I still remember early days uh, um, uh, when uh, we learned uh, seafaring. In some of the cargo ships, you take wires and you use them and uh, apply certain nuts and tighten them and secure them because you need to secure them and pay attention to what I began buoyancy and stability. There is a skill, it says if need be take the lee, if you cannot take the lee, batten up. In our lives, we need to bring effectiveness in many ways and that is what Paul did. And I will be closing with some practical tips of effectiveness, but when we take the lease, we take shelter, we do not have to always head into danger. In fact, when we speak of temptation, it is say flee from temptation, it is better to take shelter. And if we have to run into a situation, prepare due diligence, discipline, tighten up. And then comes a third bit, which is in the last from verses 19 to 26, when the storm really breaks, lighten and listen, lighten and listen. I told you about buoyancy. So, what happens is when sea gets rough, water comes inside and when water comes inside, the buoyancy reduces and the ship uh, sinks further into water. So, uh, to prevent danger, whatever is unessential, they will chuck it overboard. So, the vessel will be lighter. And then at some stage, Paul was not just looking at lightening the ship, Paul was listening to God and that is where he is able to intervene and tell them, do you know that nothing is going to happen to us? Nothing is going to happen to us because God has told me that we will not be destroyed. You should have listened to me but we will not be destroyed. I have faith in God, but ship may get destroyed. I mean, he was preparing them for the part which is uh, about to come. So, sail to the wind, take the lee and batten up, lighten and listen to God. Do not carry extra burden and that is what is there in repeated and I am not uh, going to build that on that immediately, but let me go to the third component. But what do we, how do we practically do this? How do we sail close to the wind? How do we uh, take the lee and batten up? How do we lighten and listen? Seasoned voyagers build resilience by values. You know, in seafaring, they say safety is most important and there are lessons that we learn. Uh, very simple, if a rope is kept, you never put one feet in uh, the coil of a rope because suddenly the rope may run and you will lose your leg. So, there are things that we learn. Uh, I talk about John Maxwell a lot and recently along with uh, Rob Hoskins, uh, he has produced this book called Change Your World. And you know how do you change your world? by bringing a value based system. Paul says in Ephesians 4, 14 to 15, if we build a value based, values based resilience, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. This transformation is the key purpose of storms in life, giving us the opportunity to adopt a strategy and enhance our sea worthiness or can I say life worthiness. Verse 27, the shipwreck. On the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea when at about midnight, the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They took soundings and found that the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that it would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea. 
pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So, the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You have eaten, you have not eaten anything. Now, I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. Then he said this. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach, but the ship struck a standbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping, but the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out the plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or other pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. So, I had mentioned earlier also the passage ends with a shipwreck, but it is not a sad ending. It is sad for a mariner because the ship is lost and you, you have great attachment and affection for uh, the vessel you serve in. They say ships have a spirit of their own and they have characteristics, but in the story and we can just capture back verse 41 and 44. Verse 41 does say the ship stuck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow uh, got stuck and the stern was broken into pieces and uh, it is a sight that should not be seen. You know, when you see damage happening bit by bit and wood breaking off, the amount of time it takes to build a ship and to see how a storm destroys is really tragic. But the last verse says, the rest were got there on planks or other places, other pieces of the ship everyone reached land safely. So, not one was lost and that is amazing in a storm where the ship is destroyed 276 and not one is lost. Now, all I have in this large passage from 27 to 44 uh, is the key is the character and message that Paul was sharing to the fellow voyagers and through them to us. You know, verse 30, he says, uh, verse 30, the passage says, uh, when they saw there was danger, the sailors uh, wanted to lower the lifeboat and escape. You know, in many decades ago, uh, it has happened a couple of times, the ship ran into trouble and uh, international ships have crew from many nations and sometimes there are problems in relationship on board and if there is a rough, there have been cases where a crew has let down the lifeboat and gone and later the storm passed and it was okay and they came back. Of course, it is a major disciplinary issue, but uh, not surprising because there is this feeling if the ship gets damaged, lifeboat is saved, let me go. And one thing I learnt uh, as a young mariner, the ship is the safest lifeboat. Remember in the beginning we said ship has to be storm worthy, ship has to be buoyant, it has to be stable, it is well secured. If it is a vehicle that is meant to fulfill the vision, then the order to abandon ship, you know for a captain of a ship, the hardest order is to say abandon ship. And here Paul says do not stay with the ship, if you do not stay with the ship, your life will be lost. And yet, uh, in, in fact, not just that, Paul then breaks bread. I mean, that is an ultimate assurance. Christ died for us. He has rescued us. He has saved us. Paul remembers Christ and he shares with them. He says, not one of us will be lost. That is the calm that Paul expressed. So, when 
there may be a stage where we face storms, we may even encounter a shipwreck, but here is the assurance that God has planned what our future is. What is the level of our assurance today? May we know that he will never leave us nor forsake us. The result or the final passage does not diminish the sense of cover that God provides. And so I have written this. The shocking moments of a voyage are not in the intensity and violence of the storm. Rather, it is the vain disregard to the saving provision assured by the Lord God. Now, it does not matter what the storm is, God has told us, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Time does not permit me to share a story, but let me just uh, put this in my very first year of sailing uh, by around January 84, uh, our ship was on the east coast of the USA of the US and uh, somewhere near Miami. Uh, in fact, about 100 miles east of Miami, we encountered a massive storm. It was not just a storm, the, some of the cargo on the ship moved and a few of uh, the crew were injured and there was a rescue mission and some of the crew were evacuated. And yet in that, I saw the saving provision of God. So, yes, we should be mindful of the storm, but let us be more mindful of the assurance of God on our life. So, as I close, what is the message for our life voyage from the whole passage? And I put across to you four D's. First, direction. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Remember I said about close hall? You know, go close to the wind, get the best fill, look at the wind, look at the season. In our case, we do not have to do that. We look at Christ and he has left an example in the gospel. He has left his word through the Holy Spirit. In fact, that is the second D. Design your life which is drawn not by an architect's pen, but drawn by the word of God. It is more beautiful than the best artist. It is more precise than the best architect. And the third D is divine assurance. Let us be propelled by promise. Let us, the Bible has so many promises. We, if you, some people give gifts, promise cards, great gifts. Okay, write down passages, read them. And then when we face the storm, like Paul, we can say the scripture, we can assure, we can get our encouragement back, divine assurance, like Paul has said, you will testify in Rome, you will stand before Caesar, not just you, no one with you will be destroyed. And how does all this come up? Direction, design and divine assurance? It is by diligence, a value based living every day. Which value? Kingdom values. Where do we get kingdom values? Our time with God, our time in worship our time every morning. It is so amazing. People share, uh, people post, people talk to one another, they just come and give testimony because there is something God has been teaching us. So, our life voyage with our direction on Christ, designed by God's word, divine assurance of his promises and a diligence of daily walk with God will bring success and the vehicle may get destroyed and we may have to abandon the vehicle, the, ve the ship might get wrecked, but the souls will come safe and safe to the shore. So, allow me to close and pray this for us that we will see this happen in each of our lives. Lord, we thank you for the life of Paul and the example uh, written by Luke, this entire account of the passage from Caesarea to Malta and the different components of the voyage that went through. And thank you for the learnings that come to begin a life 
with a sense of vision and to not be shocked by the storms, but to have a strategy even before the storms hit us. And Lord, go forward, enable us to go forward with the sense of assurance, even if the ship is wrecked, we will come safe to the shore. Thank you Lord for this time, in Jesus name, Amen. Thank you, God bless. Thank you, Brother Johnson, for taking us through the word. I'm sure we have been encouraged just as we looked at the life of Paul. So let us pray and bring this meeting to a close. Lord, Father, we thank you that in the book of Acts, in the life of Paul and in the lives of so many who have chosen to follow you and are recorded in the book of Acts is strong encouragement for us to fulfill our destiny. Lord, we want to thank you that you will make us go places to fulfill our destiny and neither storm nor shipwreck will stand in the way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now, May God's love, the grace of our Lord Jesus and the power and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us. Dear friends, God bless you and I look forward to catching up with you next Sunday on the Facebook and the YouTube live. But before that, I'm going to see you in a few minutes from now in the Zoom lobby. So please send a message to the number which is flashing so you can get the details of the Zoom and I'll see you there. Have a great Sunday.
Shoot me. 